started then with some alternatives to ribosomal analysis. So first of all, why is it necessary to have alternatives to ribosomal analysis? Um, well, first of all, because anything in science, you want to be able to come to a conclusion and then confirm that conclusion, right? You want to have a, a, an alternative approach that gives you the same answer before you believe it. Um, another thing is, is that ribosomal analysis, like any kind of analysis, has limitations. So things you can do with it and things you can't do with it. And the primary limitation with ribosomal analysis is in looking at, looking at organisms that are very closely related. So ribosomal analysis is a great way to get you in the ballpark of the organism, but it's a terrible way to determine exactly what it is. Um, and so one of the things I always suggest to people, how many of you guys work in a lab somewhere? Have you ever ordered an organism either from a colleague or from a culture collection or something like that? Rule one, those of you, you're all going to end up in a lab somewhere at some point, I hope. Rule one is when you get an organism from somebody, the first thing you do is sequence this ribosomal on it. Someday you'll thank me for that advice. Doesn't matter whether you get the culture from a famous colleague, someone you know, someone just down the hall, from the ATCC or DSM. Um, prove to yourself that it is what you think it is. I can't tell you how many months of time have been wasted in my group working on an organism that wasn't what we thought it was. This happens all the time particularly with these culture collectives, by the way. Even just an E. coli strain. You may not know what strain it is from ribosomal analysis, but you want to show, first and foremost, that it's actually E. coli. Anyway, you can, you, ribosomal analysis is great for determining organisms down to about the genus level, but any closer than that, ribosomal RNA won't tell you. Because when you get to about the genus level, the number of sequence differences between two ribosomal RNAs is too small to be statistically relevant. There are extreme cases of this. Bacillus anthracis and Bacillus cereus have identical ribosomal sequences. And yet, it's pretty important to know which one you've got if you've got it growing in your gut, right? Um, Pathogenic strains of salmonella and non-pathogenic are going to have identical ribosomal sequences. At the same time, most organisms have more than one copy of the ribosomal RNA gene, and they're not always identical in the same organism. And so, for example, there are three differences in E. coli ribosomal sequences in between the different sets of operons. And so if you see a, a single difference, you don't know whether that means anything or not. There are a few cases where the ribosomal RNAs are significantly different than that. For the purpose of statistics, and we'll see later when we do some metagenomic stuff and, and microbiome stuff, the usual threshold is 97%. And so if two sequences are more than 97% identical, you, you don't feel like you can reliably um, distinguish them. Those are oftentimes called uh, operational taxonomic units. There's actually a bigger problem. So, so ribosomal sequences only have the resolution to get you down to 97% or so. The big issue, though, is what is a species when it comes to microbes? Now, what's a species in the macroscopic? What's the definition of a species of a plant or an animal? Yeah. Yeah, so, so if two organisms are in a population where they can reproduce and produce viable offspring, then they're considered to be the same species. Now, have any of you read Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species? Probably ought to. It's a really good book, actually. Um, he spends about a third of that book arguing that species aren't part and fast categories. 
and, and it's absolutely true. Let me give you an example. If you have a, a Chihuahua and a Doberman Pinscher, they will not breed and produce viable offspring. It's not physically possible for them to do so. If you have two females, it's impossible for them to breed and produce viable offspring. Are they the same species? Sure they are. Um, there are any number of cases like this. I mean, if a person is infertile, does that mean they're not human? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Um, so these definitions are squishy. And, and there are any number of things. Have you all heard of ring species? There's, there's a species of duck that exists on the Arctic Circle. And interestingly, as you go east, it, you get geographic variation. And if you go west, you get a different kind of geographic variation. And if you keep going, those two overlap. And they look like different species. Or those ranges overlap. And yet, you can follow them all the way around, and they're clearly the same species if you follow them all the way around. There are salamanders in the, uh, the Great Valley in California that do this. If you follow the, the, the valley around, you see that, that it, what look like two species in one place are actually one species. Lots and lots of cases of this kind of squishiness in, in species. And so even at the level of plants and animals, species is kind of a sloppy definition. Another way to think about this is species over time. Think of them not just as the species that exist today, but trace them back. And you can, I mean, species change over time. And where do you draw the line between when it's one species and when it's a different species? Where do you draw the line, for example, between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens? Because it's a gradual progression with little branches that dead end and all that kind of stuff. And there's no place where you can draw a line objectively that says this is where it changes from one species to another. It's even worse in the microbial world. Where do you draw the line? What's the difference between two different strains of one species and two different species of the same genus? I mean, realistically, it, it's your opinion. Um, some people like to define anything you can distinguish phenotypically as a different species. Other people will have to have some more important distinction between them. And there isn't any objective way to do it. If you've got a culture, a culture of E. coli and you split it and you keep passaging it year after year after year, do they remain the same species? Well, that depends, right, on your view. There isn't, as bad as the definition of a species is in the plant and animal world, there just is, isn't an objective definition even that bad for bacteria because they don't reproduce sexually. There are no breeding populations. Yeah, they exchange DNA, but it's haphazardly. I think that's one of the most important questions in the world of microbiology today is to come up with a real definition of what a species or what a strain, etc., is. If those things could be defined, I think we would learn a lot. So if you're looking, so again, you can't distinguish close relatives with ribosomal analysis. So what are some of the alternatives? Well, we talked about all the reasons why RNAs are good for phylogenetic analysis. Might there be some RNAs that are more highly variable that you could use for sequences that are too, for organisms that are too closely related to distinguish with ribosomal RNA? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the large subunit ribosomal RNA, but it turns out that that's not been so useful. Uh, the, the large subunit of the ribosomal RNA is a little bit more variable than the small subunit, but only on average. And the range of variation is much narrower. In other words, there's less this patchwork of highly conserved and highly variable that you see in the, in the small subunit ribosomal RNA. In general, the large subunit RNA has a much narrower range of variation tRNAs are too small, the 5-sRNA is too small, in eukaryotes the 5.8-sRNA is too small. Um, things like the signal recognition particle RNA and the tmRNA, you guys know what these things are? Probably not. Uh, tmRNA is involved in bacteria in releasing ribosomes that come to the end of the messenger RNA before it hits a stop codon, which happens when RNAs are degraded. Um, signal recognition protocol RNA is involved in the secretion of some proteins. 
But these things are too variable to be useful for this kind of analysis. The one RNA that's proven to be generally useful for this is the RNA's pRNA. This is what we work with in my group. Not so much the phylogenetic part of it, though. And I've shown you this molecule before. This is the RNA's pRNA from Methanothermobacter from Its name has been changed since I did this. It's about 350 nucleotides long, very highly conserved in structure, but, but about six times more variable in sequence than ribosomal RNA. And so it, it's, even though it's much shorter, it provides you with variation that you don't see in, in small subunit RNA. And so this can sometimes be useful. And so just for example, here's, here's a phylogenetic tree of archaea based on RNA's pRNA. And to a large extent, this matches that of the ribosomal RNA, as you would expect, right? But sometimes ribosomal RNA gives you inconsistent answers. And so one of the questions that's been around a long time is, what, where, who's Archaeoglobus related to? Because when you do the trees, depending on how you tweak the parameters, sometimes it ends up here amongst the methanococci, sometimes it ends up um, here related to the methanosarcina. And so with RNA's pRNA, we can show pretty definitively, we, and we can do better than that with more archaeoglobal sequences, that it is in fact related to the methanococci. And that raises an interesting question, because these are methanogens, and these are methanogens, but this isn't. But it turns out it used to be. We'll talk about that later on. It's got all the genes from methanogenesis. It runs the methanogenesis pathway in reverse. To take, to take methyl groups from lactate and related compounds and make CO2 from it instead. But RNASP only gets you a little better than ribosomal RNA for close relatives. And it's a tough molecule to do alignments with. Right? Um, so what are some other ones? Probably the most commonly used one is the ribosomal spacer. So in most organisms, whether eukaryotes or, or bacteria or archaea, the genes that encode the ribosomal RNA are in this order. So the gene for the small subunit RNA is upstream, downstream is the large subunit RNA, and then the 5.8S large subunit RNAs, or 5, 5S is right here. In eukaryotes, the 5.8S RNA is actually homologous to the first part of the large subunit RNA. It's just a separate into two different RNAs. This isn't universally true, but it's almost universally true. This is a great target for looking at highly variable stuff, because these spacers are highly variable. There's a bunch of stuff in there. I mean, it's not just junk. Um, uh, there are a bunch of processing signals, things that are used to, to, to target cleavages in this region so that these RNAs can be processed out of transcripts. Um, there's a, a bunch of signals in there for methylations. Oftentimes, there are genes for transfer RNA embedded in there. But they're, a lot, they're pretty highly variable. But they're flanked by highly conserved sequences. That makes them good targets for PCR, right? You design a forward primer here, a reverse primer here. You amplify the stuff in between, which is highly variable. And that gives you highly variable sequences to do an analysis with. This is used primarily um, for, for dis distinguishing strains of the same species in bacteria and different animal species from another. Um, it's used a lot, for example, to study insect evolution and that sort of thing. You can get even more variable than this. If you really want to push the process, at least in eukaryotes, you can do this same analysis, but targeting the mitochondrial RNAs instead of the nuclear ones. Mitochondrial genes evolve very, very fast compared to nuclear genes. Probably the reason for this is because those RNAs, for example, just as an example of that stuff, only have to translate a couple of dozen proteins in most um, mitochondrial uh, organelles. And so that the range of proteins they have to be able to handle is fairly small. They can evolve much more quickly than selective pressures relax on them. And so these things can be used a lot for that. 
The problem is that it gets complicated, particularly in bacteria, because of the issue of gene families. And so in the case of E. coli, as an example, there's seven ribosomal operons. Four of one type, four have one sequence here, and three have a different sequence here. That's actually pretty common in bacteria generally. There's one tRNA space, or one ribosomal space that has a glutamic acid tRNA in it, and another one that has, I can't remember, isoleucine valine in there. Now, the advantage of this is you know right away which one is which. But you have, if you're going to do an analysis with these, you have to, to separate these. For one thing, you're going to get two bands on the PCR gel, right? So you cut them out, sequence them, and then... Um, you know, you do the alignment with the appropriate spacer, not just a random. You can use proteins for molecular phylogenetic analysis. And in some cases, this is a great approach. Theoretically, there's a lot more information in a protein alignment than there is in an RNA alignment because there are 20 amino acids instead of just four bases. And you can create great tables that show you the relative frequency of substitution from one amino acid to another. These are called the PAM tables. Um, and so, for example, a substitution of leucine to isoleucine is relatively frequent. and It's a minor change in a, in a sequence. Whereas change from aspartic acid to asparagine is quite a large difference, and so counts as a big hit. But there are a number of reasons why protein alignments and protein trees are more dangerous than RNA trees. But the primary one is this first one here. Protein sequences, when you, do a, when you do an RNA alignment, you align the RNA based on its structure. When you do a protein alignment, you almost always just use a program that makes the sequences look as much alike as they can and leave it at that. You don't, you're not really looking at homology. You're just looking at similarity. Now, it is possible to create protein alignments based on the structures of those proteins, if you know the structures. There are some protein families where there are hundreds of structures available, three-dimensional crystal structures. It's like ferredoxins. Um, but it's a lot of work to go through three-dimensional structures and identify homologous amino acids computationally and sort them out that way, and almost nobody does it. It's also possible if you have one or two structures to do something called homology modeling, where you thread a new sequence into that structure and do a bunch of energy minimizations and make a predictive structure and do the alignment based on that. Again, almost nobody does that. The problem is that in a protein alignment made this way, probably there are chunks of it that are good alignments, but there are going to be major chunks of it that are not. It's very common for the ends of the, of the amino acid sequences to be completely unalignable. If you've got a multi-domain protein, usually the, the, the spacer between the two domains is unalignable. It's absolutely critical then before you generate trees based on those alignments, that you erase all those unalignable regions and not include them in the tree process. It's just noise. And only include in the tree analysis the parts of the amino acid sequence alignment that you know is reliable. The issue is how do you determine that? Um, in a protein alignment, it's not really clear that different amino acids evolve independently. In the case of an RNA alignment, the two bases of a base pair um, seem to evolve almost entirely independently of, of everything else in the RNA. It doesn't matter in a secondary structure. If there's a base pair there, it doesn't matter what base pair it is, usually. And so it, th those base pairs are free to evolve. But in a protein, you've got a compact hydrophobic core, and a change of one amino acid in that core has an impact on a, a selective pressure on all the amino acids around it, so that amino acids don't evolve independently, at least not as independent, independently as nucleotides. Um, protein sequences are short compared to RNAs. I mean, there aren't very many proteins that are 1,500 
mass as well, like the small sodium and ribosome RNA. And generally speaking, the alignments are better, and so you can get more phylogenetic information out of an RNA alignment than you can a protein alignment. Gene families are a nightmare for most proteins. I mentioned globins already, but that's just one example. There are gene families, at least particularly in eukaryotes, of, of most of the proteins in the cell. Uh, horizontal transfer, th there's a bit of a caveat to this. So horizontal transfer is more common for protein coding genes than for RNA encoding genes. But not all protein coding genes are alike this way. We're going we're to talk later, uh, Wednesday, about horizontal transfer. It turns out that there's about 30 or 40 percent of the genes in an organism that are very highly resistant to horizontal transfer. This includes protein encoding genes. These are the genes for information processing. Replication, DNA replication, DNA repair, transcription, translation, this sort of thing. Genes that encode phenotype and metabolism tend to be very highly transferred, frequently transferred. And so those kind of proteins are probably not the best choice for this kind of analysis. There are some really good markers, really highly conserved proteins that are where horizontal transfer seems to be rare, um, and where alignments can be done properly. These are things like DNA polymerase subunits, RNA polymerase subunits, some glycolytic enzymes, glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase has been used for this a lot, some electron transport enzymes, although of course not all organisms have electron transport, so you can't include those. Um, So-called heat shock proteins are used for this a lot, stress response proteins. And I think one of the places where this is going in the future are catenated alignments. And so these are alignments of more than one molecule at a time. Imagine making an alignment where the first part is the small subunit of the ribosome. Well, let's look at it this way. What if it, instead of aligning this sequence, or this sequence, or this sequence, or this sequence, you align the entire thing? And then maybe you tack on RNAs P here and tmRNA here. You make an alignment that contains a series of molecules all aligned together. That pools the phylogenetic information in the alignment, and you get, in general, much better trees that way. As long as everything you align is done properly on its own. Not a good idea to include different kinds of molecules. You wouldn't want to put proteins here and RNAs here. Can you imagine why not? Degeneracy of the code, right? Do you include the DNA for the amino acids or do you include the amino acids themselves? The issue is, is that remember that the step between the alignment and the tree generation is this substitution model stuff, right? That's an evolutionary model. And so you can't have a good evolutionary model that applies to both RNA and protein encoding sequences because those sequences evolve differently. And so you have to keep those separate. What's the ultimate case of using catenated alignments? Full genomes. It's just now becoming possible to align entire genomes and do phylogenetic trees based on those. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And usually, yeah. And usually, in that case, the people will use the proteins only, and they'll only use the protein coding sequences that are present in all the ones they're going to do. So they don't use the entire genome. Notice that you also have to rearrange the genomes to make that work, right? Because genomes don't have genes in the same order. Normally, they don't include spacers. It's really just a collection of open reading frames that are common to all the sequences. People aren't yet to the point where they align entire genomes. The real problem with this at this point, there's a couple problems, but the real major issue is, is that most protein coding genes are just terrible for phylogenetic analysis. And the result is that, that most of your phylogenetic information is drowned out by all the noise of, of these kind of giant alignments. And so the, align, the, the computer chugs and chugs away for days and days and days, and you get a tree and all the bootstrap values 
But I think in the future, this is going to be a really important tool.